Hello, hello. Uh, can you all please settle down? Uh, those who don't have a seat can come to the front. Okay, we don't have a seat. Please come to the front. There's a few seats here. Settle down. Okay, there's a wow. Good they have a bell here. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Okay, so um, it's a big class, and they gave us this LT. Uh, previously, we were having the LT 15, which was bigger. Uh, don't worry, I'm, I'm sure the numbers will go down over the week, so you'll have more space after some time. Okay? Uh, so don't need to worry, only first week you have this problem. Okay? But, okay, so of course for your benefit, we have webcasts. Uh, so for webcasts, uh, as you know, we are transitioning to Luminous. Huh? From IBLE, we are transitioning to Luminous. But of course, all the faculty are so scared of something new, correct? So everybody is sticking with IBLE. Okay? Uh, so the, IBL, the webcasts, Lectures will be posted to Luminous, and in our IVLE there is a multimedia folder that will link you back to Luminous. Okay, so the webcast is still there, except that for IVLE they have a link in the multimedia folder that will link you back to Luminous to see the webcast. Okay, uh, but of course, if possible, just come for the lecture. Correct? If you do webcast, a two-hour lecture will become four-hour lecture. Correct? Because every half, every few minutes you have to message your friend, you need to update your Facebook. Okay, so you become a very draggy. Uh, experience. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Okay, so welcome back uh, to this semester. Uh, this is CS2100, so let me give a quick uh, intro about uh, this module. Okay, uh, so this is a big cohort, I think uh, so far one of the biggest. Uh, last semester, uh, it was even a bigger actually, it was about 200 over. So currently we are almost hitting 200, okay, uh, the class size. Okay, so myself, my name is Ravi, okay, uh, this is the second time I'm running this module, okay, uh, last, last year when I did this module, things were slightly different, okay, what was different, uh, in this run, we have introduced uh, some C programming in the beginning, which wasn't uh, present before, okay, and the reason is because of some changes at year one modules, we decided that C should be incorporated, or at least a, a very... Uh, summarized version of C should be incorporated in this module. Okay, so that is included. And the difference also is if you look at two semesters ago, the approach was considered a bottom-up approach. Okay, bottom-up in a sense that we started from very low-level circuits, uh, logic gate, all the way up to processor-level architecture. Uh, in this semester, or in, from last semester onwards, we switched the order, so we are going top-down. Okay, that means from a high-level perspective, we are going down all the way to low-level logic gates. Okay, so that is the difference between uh, this semester and previous semester. So those of you who have maybe notes from earlier, your batch friends and so on, if you look through the notes, you will see there is a reverse order, okay? Okay, so um, this is my contact details. If you want to see me, just email me. Okay, that's the best. Okay, so there is no fixed slot uh, because I also cannot guarantee a fixed slot. Okay, so easier if you just email me and you say you want to see me at uh, this day, this time, and then uh, we can uh, make time for that. Okay. Okay, so everything will be uploaded on IBLE on a weekly basis. Okay, so for now, week one and week two materials are already up. Okay, so uh, progressively we will upload. Okay. Okay, so the objective of this module. Okay, so for most of you, this module will cover things which you will probably never see anywhere else. Okay, why? Because this is one of the very few CS, a CS code module that actually has a fair mix of hardware involved. Okay, so that's why I say you won't probably see this anywhere else. Okay, so this module has a bit of hardware as well as software. 
Okay, so this is a very unique module. Okay, so you will start off with C programming, like I said, but it's a very uh, short and summarized C. Right? It's not the full C that you probably will learn in a proper 13-week uh, module. Okay, so it's a very shortened version. Then we will talk about data representation and number system. Okay, so how do you represent data in numbers? Okay, uh, in terms of binary or hexadecimal and so on. Then we're going to do some assembly language programming. Okay, so the, this programming is again a very different type of programming because it just is at a middle level. Okay, not your high level Python or Java, but not uh, at a lower level considered assembly language. Then we go into processor architecture. Okay, so we're actually going to go in to a processor and see what happens inside. Okay, so we always are very good at writing code. We know we execute, you know, it runs. But actually, what happens? Correct? After I click the run button, what actually happens? Huh? How does the processor go about step by step to execute the code for me? Okay? Uh, pipelining and cache are again more hardware specific topics. That means within the processor itself, what can we do to make it more efficient, optimize the performance? Correct? So when you do software, you learn about software optimization. Correct? How you allocate memory, how you structure it, how you write a loop. You know, to reduce the uh, uh, time complexity and so on. So pipelining and cache are more at the hardware specific. Okay, so when I have so many instructions executing, how can the processor architecture be optimized, correct, to to improve the throughput of the system? Okay, then at the very lowest level, we're going to go into logic gates. Okay, that means effectively when you go down, we talk about AND gates, OR gates, multiplexers, decoders, and so on. Okay, so it's, it's a mix of uh, software all the way down to hardware. Okay, so uh, in terms of the lab, okay, so what will you do? You will have, uh, again, a mix of hardware and software related uh, lab experiments. Okay, so we have a logic trainer board here. So in this, you will actually build some circuits. Okay, some simple circuits. Uh, don't worry, nobody will get an electrocuter one. Huh? Okay, this one is all uh, DC voltage, 5 volt. You will touch it, I think. Okay, then uh, of course we have some uh, software. So these are all the logic gates. So don't worry, uh, this one is just to show you a high level picture. We will learn all this along the way. Okay, so we will learn how to, uh, what are all these kind of different logic gates here? Okay, how do you connect these gates together to implement a particular logic that you want? Okay, uh, then we will also do assembly language. So this, uh, it's a bit small here, but this code that you see here, that is assembly language. Okay, so it's a different form of programming. Okay, very much linked to the hardware that you're dealing with. Okay, when you write in high level, when you write in C, when you write in Java or Python, you do not care too much about the system it runs on. You will run on your laptop, you will run on your friend's laptop, you will run everywhere. Correct? But in assembly language, we go at a lower level and we look exactly at, okay, if now I'm dealing with a Intel processor, there are only specific instructions I can use. If I switch to a Motorola processor, then there are specific instructions I can use. So assembly language is more specific, okay? Uh, targeted at the hardware you're using. So we are going to be doing that as well. Ah, important one, correct? Assessment. Okay, so this time assessment, I think, is uh, a bit better. Uh, we have tutorial, attendance plus participation, okay? So attendance and participation, for tutorial is 5%. Okay, labs is 15%. Okay, so all the labs have some weightage. Okay, so if you look in the lab sheet, there's a weightage there, okay? And we also give you the breakdown of what is uh, the breakdown of the different components. Okay, so when, uh, I think the first lab I just uploaded, okay, so later you can go and check. Okay, uh, then you will be able to see what are the deliverables. Okay, then there's a midterm test. 30% uh, and final exam 50%. Okay, so uh, this is the breakdown. Midterm test uh, most likely will be either the end of the recess week or the week immediately after recess week. Okay, uh, once I get confirmation on the MPSH booking, I'll let you know. Okay, uh, both the tests are closed book, uh, no reference sheet allowed. Okay. So assessment quite straightforward, huh? so not, not too many components. So tutorial, labs, midterm, and final, that's it. Okay? 
Okay, so there are two textbooks recommended. Uh, in my life as a student, I've never bought any recommended text because there's never no never time to read anything beside the lecture notes. Okay, so if you want to buy, you got too much money, don't know what to do, please go and buy. Okay? Uh, if not, I think the lecture notes are sufficient, uh, online resources are sufficient, okay? Uh, but again, these are, are uh, some reference text uh, for you to, to, to refer to. Okay, so again, I mean methods, I think all are done, webcast, tutorials, lab. Okay, so tutorials and labs will start in week three. Okay, 27 August that week. Okay, that's the time we will start. Okay, there is an IBLE forum that has been, has been created. Okay, with three chapters, uh, three topic headers there. Okay, so uh, any questions that you think you want to have open discussion, you can post it there and hopefully uh, somebody replies. Okay, so anybody can reply. Huh? So don't need to wait for anybody. Okay, if you think you have something to contribute, then you can always uh, reply. There are some seats here. There are some seats in front here. Okay, okay so uh, online registration for your tutorial and lab, please get it done. Okay? Uh, if you have any challenge, if you have anything that you clash and you cannot resolve, then you email me. If not, you go through the course. Okay? Only thing, as long as course cannot resolve it, then you come to me. Okay? Uh, once you have your booking, please stick to it. Like I said, attendance uh, and participation in tutorials is graded, okay? So if you jump around everywhere, then your attendance or participation may be missed out. Okay, so please stick with the lab group once you uh, uh, sign. If you are unable to attend, you need to have a valid reason and you need to update me in advance, okay? Uh, for the reason why you're not able to attend any of the class, okay? So uh, for in this semester, I'm also trying something new to create short, uh, bite-sized videos to explain certain concepts. Okay, so those videos will be updated to YouTube, and I'll share the link in the IBLE as well. Okay, so uh, the reason why I did this is because I know our students, not students, uh, all of us, our attention span is very short. Correct. One hour webcast, you fall asleep halfway, then you don't know which one you miss. Okay, so at least I, I try to create bite-sized videos focusing on different parts that I think are important. Okay, so hopefully those parts you get it. Okay, uh, so that's the end for the Q&A. Okay, important thing uh, before you start the official lecture. Along the way, some of you may get lost, you don't know what's happening. Then you're thinking, why did I even take this module? Correct, some of you have no choice, uh, compulsory. Okay, but if you are lost, please seek help early. Okay, in the past, when the midterm is next week, students will come knocking on my door and they are stuck at tutorial one. Okay, very difficult to help you, huh? very difficult. Okay, so if you are already lost in tutorial one, tutorial two, then you must immediately seek help. Huh? You delay, delay, you're just prolonging the suffering only. Correct, it's not solved yet. Okay, so seek help early. Huh? So you can talk to me, you can talk to your tutor, anybody. Okay, but if you get help early, you will be safe, don't worry. Uh, it's a long and tiring and painful journey, but there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Always remember that. Okay? Okay, so let's... Uh, okay, so let's start uh, officially. Yeah? Okay, uh, I know usually the first week, First lecture, you think, well, I can relax on corner, just half an hour, can go back home already. Unfortunately, we cannot do it. Huh? Uh, because if you look at the, I, I've uploaded the weekly plan. Okay, our schedule is very tight. Okay, in fact, you all are very lucky. The previous batch was even more chala one. Okay, we had a lot more stuff cram in. Okay, but along the way, students complain and complain and complain, so we cut and cut and cut and cut. Okay? So we really cut a lot of things along the way already. Okay? So in the previous batch, they had it much worse. Okay, so you can see after we cut, we are still cramped at 13 weeks. Okay, uh, so we really have not much of a breathing space to have uh, early dismissal or whatever. Okay, so I will try to finish up whatever I can. Uh, in between, we will have a break. Uh, don't run away during the break. Uh, please come back and then we will carry on. Hopefully by 5.40, I should aim to finish. Okay, okay so let's start with the first 
topic on high level language to computer organization. Okay, so of course when I took this module first last year, I was thinking, why they spell organization, organization? Is it S or Z? So I decided to do some investigation. This is not examinable, uh, by the way. Okay, this is just for my own interest. Why did they say Z or S? Okay, so I also was confused. All the while, I think when I was primary school, I always stay Z. Then Scully come here, become S. So I wanted to see what is it. So uh, when I do some research, it seems to me that Z is more preferred than S. Okay, for organization. Okay, so of course, uh, in Google, they also give the answer that over the years, organization is more preferred the organization in S. Uh, but I think NUS will not change, uh, too much paperwork. Okay, so we will stick with organization with the S. Okay, so let's start with uh, programming languages. Okay, so programming languages, uh, you all have studied a lot. You will study a lot more, okay, through the course of the study. And effectively, what is a programming language? It's just nothing more than a set of instructions to solve a problem, all right? To solve a problem. Okay? So, at a high level program, like what you see at the top here, this is, this is a C syntax here, okay? Uh, similar to maybe Java or Python, okay? Uh, it's just a bit of difference here and there, but ultimately the idea is the same. You declare some variable, okay? You have some decision making, you have some loops, are uh, the same thing, okay? It's just that the way we write it, where you put a comma, where you put a colon, and so on, okay? Uh, of course, that is at a high level, okay? So if you have studied those 1010 modules or 1101, then you would have already been expert in all this, all right? Okay? So that is at the high level where you program. When you program at this high level, you do not care too much about the low level, all right? As long as your C program compile, you're happy already, submit, okay? You do not care too much of whether I'm running on what kind of hardware, what kind of constraint I have, okay? Because you're running on your PC, your desktop, okay? Your desktop has so much of resources, don't need to worry, okay? In this module, we are going to look at C, and we are also going to be looking at how it translates into what we call assembly language. Okay, so in assembly language, it is very specific. Okay, one assembly language, uh, assembly language written for a particular processor will not be easily portable over to another processor. So if I decide to switch processor halfway through a project, then I may have to rewrite all my code again. Okay, it's not so easily portable from one processor to another processor, unless it's like within the same family, then maybe possible. Okay, so you, as you can see, uh, in assembly language is uh, a bit more uh, troublesome because there are a lot more lines. Okay, so this code and this code are actually doing the same thing. Huh? So you can see there are a lot more lines and it's not so reader friendly. Alright, not so reader friendly uh, if you do not know how, what the syntax is talking about. Okay. But eventually, uh, eventually, when it goes down to the processor, your computer can only recognize two symbols, correct? One and zero. And uh, no matter what you write, eventually come to one and zero only. Uh, we are ruling the whole world with two digits. Okay? So the one and zero are the only two things that your computer or your, your processor recognizes. Okay? It's just a way, it's just a way in which we rearrange all these one and zeros to tell the processor what to do. Okay? So this is the eventual code that your processor executes, okay? So at the highest level, we go to a middle level, which is the, what are you doing? Okay, to assembly, uh, to assembly, assembly language, and finally to machine level code. Okay, so let's uh, look at classification again. Okay, so, we have machine level language, okay? So this machine language, okay, this machine language is the ones and zeros that I said just now, okay? So this ones and zeros, what's the problem? Okay, it is very efficient, but very difficult to write. Okay, nobody wants to write code as ones and zeros, correct? Okay? Then, of course, we move on to assembly language, which is what we saw just now. Assembly language is a bit easier to write the machine code, but it is, again, very specific to the hardware, okay? So it's good for execution, okay, but it's specific to hardware, okay? Then, of course, we go on to third generation language, which is a bit more closer to English, like your C programming, okay? So it's more readable, uh, more friendly to write and to read, 
Okay, and of course from C kind of language, which is compiled language, we have moved to scripting language uh, like SQL, PostScript, and so on, where you don't necessarily compile the code, but whatever you write, you translate it with the script. Okay, the current trend, of course, is moving towards AI, where you have uh, descriptive language. Okay, so instead of programming uh, low-level tasks, you go up to program behavior. All right, you say if this happens. Or this event triggers, go and activate this particular action. So you are, instead of looking at a, a higher level, you're going to even a higher level called behavioral. Right? A behavioral kind of a language. So this is the progression uh, over the years from where we started to, to where we are right now. Okay, so again, you can classify it in different ways, okay, in terms of generation or hierarchy. Okay, but ultimately, it all comes back to different ways of programming. Okay? Uh, so again, programming language, there are scripting language and programming language. Okay, when you say you have a programming language like C or Java, you are generally writing it and you're going to compile it. Okay, and then you're going to execute it on a machine. Okay, in scripting language, you write it as a script and then it gets executed without compilation. Okay, that means as a script itself, it gets executed. So it just, but again, if you look at the notes in more detail, the lines are getting very fuzzy. Okay, so even uh, Python can now be compiled, okay, or Java can, is, they have JavaScript, okay, so there is a lot of now cross-boundary kind of uh, uh, behavior in the languages that we are dealing with. Okay, so C programming language, okay, so like I said, we are going to go into a bit of C programming basics, okay, uh, in the first week one and week two, okay, and in C programming language, okay, where did it get started? It started in uh, 1970s, okay, uh, in Bell Laboratories, okay. So this is the founder, Dennis Ritchie, okay, who created this programming language, okay. And one of the reasons uh, why it is uh, so widely used is it maps very efficiently to machine level instructions, okay. So you will see that until now, even though we have so many new languages that have come out, so you can see 1970s started. Okay, now we are to 2018, so many years have passed. But still, in the industry, C is still the most preferred language when it comes to low-level hardware. Okay, why? Because it is still very easily translatable to the hardware that you deal with. Okay, which you will see uh, in this course. Okay, so it is very, very close to the machine level. So that is why, until now, uh, it is still the most preferred language. Okay, of course, if you go into high-level application development, you will use a lot of other languages. But as long as you're dealing with hardware, you will still deal with C. Okay? Okay, so how do you create a C program? Okay, so uh, before I carry on, some of you may have already uh, be expert in C because you did your CS1010. Okay, so if you have already done your CS1010 module in C, okay, then you just take week one and week two as a refresher. Okay, uh, because we are just going to summarize everything uh, in two weeks. Okay, so if you've not done it, then you take it as a, a good learning point for you. Okay, so when you create a, to create a C program, you start off first by writing the source code. Okay, the source code is what you type in in an editor, you know, in a, in a .c file. Okay, and after that, what do you do? You have to click on the co compile button. Okay, when you click on the compile button, the compiler will come in and it will convert your source code into what is called an object code. Okay, and in this object code, okay, you then need to link it together with other object code. Why? Because your whole project may have multiple C files. Okay, so all these C files will then need to be linked together, okay, together with other library files. Okay, library files are files that you use that are already provided by the C uh, development environment. Okay, and eventually everything comes together and then you get an executable code, the .exe which is what you execute, okay? So once you, ex you e run the executable code, that is the version of whatever code that you have written. Okay, so this is uh, a simple code written on the SOC Unix server, okay? So again, we always start with hello world, okay? So let's look at this code here. So after you 
So your Vim is your basic editor, correct? So when you do your Vim and you create your file and after you save it, okay, what you need to do is you use the command gcc, okay, gcc your file name, okay. And when you do gcc your file name, what will it do? It will compile and link this file, okay. And when you compile and link this file, it will generate a dot out file here, okay. And this dot out file is the executable file. Okay, so when you type in, for example, a dot out, the code that you've written here will execute. And this code here is doing nothing more than just saying print out hello world. Okay, so that is what comes out here. Okay, so this is a very simple illustration on how to uh, create a simple C file and compile it. Okay, so don't worry too much. Huh? In your first lab, you will actually go through this. Okay, so you go through the lab manual, you sort of understand how this whole thing works. Okay, so the GCC command uh, hides the details. If you want to go and display all the details, you can add in a minus V command prior to the file name. Okay, so when you do that, when you compile, it will also pro provide you with a list of all the details of what it is doing step by step. Okay, before it generates the final uh, output file for you. Okay. And what are the steps? Okay, uh, pre-processing, compilation, assembler, and linker. Okay, these steps we will go through again in detail over the next few slides. Okay, so coming back to this thing again. Okay, our high-level language written in C. Okay, is again is very easy, very straightforward, and it's very uh, reader-friendly. When you click on the compile button, you actually translate it into assembly language. Okay? So in this module, you are going to learn how to do this manually. Okay, given a C program, how do I convert it to an equivalent assembly language program? Right now your compiler does it for you. Right? When you click on compile, it automatically translates for you. Okay, but in this course, you're also going to learn how to do it yourself. Okay? Well, how do I take a, for example, a C loop? and write a MIPS assembly language loop uh, equivalent. Okay. Then of course, finally, when, you, when your compiler links everything together and create the final executable file, that is all in ones and zeros, which we cannot understand now. But we will understand this later on. Okay, later on, when we look at the MIPS uh, instruction encoding, then we will see how this one and zero actually translate to instruction. Okay. Okay, so let's have a, a, a bird's eye view of where we are in terms of the whole scheme of things. Okay, so your application software is what? Your application software is a software that you run from a user perspective. Okay, take for example your smartphone. If you take out your smartphone and you, for example, launch your Google Maps to know where you are, that is your application software. Right? So this application software will run on top of the OS in your system. Okay, so if let's say you're using a smartphone, it will run on your Android or iOS or whatever. Okay, so your iOS or Android OS, okay, is working as the baseline to host your application software. Okay, so your application software is written for this particular OS. Okay, of course, when you write your application software, you also compile it. Correct, uh, whether you are doing Android uh, app or iOS app, you, when you finish your whole code, you still need to compile it and package it your OS, correct? So you have a whole software that is designed and built for the OS that you're running on. Now let's look at the hardware perspective. When you look at the hardware, what do you see? Okay, whether it's your PC or your handphone or whatever. Okay, just like when you go to buy a handphone. Any handphone, uh, the advertisers, what do they focus on now? The two things they always focus on is what? Processor and your memory, correct? Okay, they always try to advertise on what kind of high-end processor they are hosting in your system. Okay, and they also try to advertise on the memory, how much memory it has, uh, how much uh, ROM it has or flash it has, how much RAM it has, and so on. And you talk about other I.O. systems, okay, in terms of connectivity, Bluetooth, camera, and so on. Okay, so these are the selling points in terms of the hardware. Okay, so of course, that is at the very high level perspective. But in this module, we are also going to go deeper to understand how all these things are interconnected. Okay? 
And that interconnection is what we call the data part and control design. Okay, so we are actually going to look into how a processor is going to be connected to a memory, is going to be connected to an I.O. device, and so on. Okay, how everything is interconnected together. Okay, and when we study about that, we also need to have some perspective of digital logics. Okay, why? Because ultimately, when you design a data part, when you want to channel data from one section of your hardware device to another channel, you need to have some form of control. Okay, so all of that is achieved through your logic gates, okay, which we will look at. Okay, and logic gates effectively constitute your whole circuit design. Okay, so when you look at your, your PC motherboard or your laptop board or your handphone, if you open up inside, you see that whole board with all the circuit tree inside, correct? So that is the entire circuit design. Okay, so, so you see there are two separate sections now, correct? One is the entire software and the other is the entire hardware. Okay, and what is the link? Okay, the link between your software and hardware is your instruction set architecture. Okay, ISA. Okay, this instruction set architecture is the one that translates and gives us the interpretation of how the code that you write is going to be translated to the hardware that you have. Okay? So, of course, this may be transparent depending on which level you are looking at. Okay? If you are writing at an application software level, again, this is transparent. But when you are talking at maybe at the OS level or the compiler level, then your ISA is important. Okay? So, in this module, we're going to learn how to understand the instruction set architecture of a processor and how I can write code that is going to be efficiently run on a particular type of processor. Okay, so uh, where will you learn all this thing? Okay, uh, operating system is CS2106. Uh, there's another module that I teach, CG2271, which is real-time operating system. Okay, so both quite interlinked. Okay, in operating system, uh, when you study operating system, you will learn uh, a different perspective of programming. Okay, why? Because when you deal with the OS, uh, before you come to OS, your mind is running on a single thread. Okay, when you come to OS, your mind will have to switch to multi-threaded. Okay, uh, actually we all do multi-threading, correct? Because while you're pretending to listening to me, you're also busy checking your WhatsApp and your Facebook. Correct, so we're actually multi-threading. Correct, but how do you apply that in the code? Okay, so that is uh, operating system. Uh, compiler is CS4212 if you're interested. And in this module, CS2100 is the entire ISA going down. Okay, that means going towards the processor, data part, and digital logic design. Okay, so of course from logic design to go to circuit level design, transistor level design is going more and more into the electronics part of it, which we're not going to cover. Okay, so we will stop at logic gates. Okay, but if you want to dig deeper to transistor level, also can. Like I said, in the past, we used to go down to transistor level. Okay, two batches ago. Okay, then now we took that out. We got a lot of students say, why must I study all this? I am a CS student. Okay, so we, okay, never mind, never mind, okay, relax, so we took out. <laughs> okay, so now we stop at digital logic. So you all should thank your seniors, correct? Uh, because they complain, 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 so we have to adjust, correct? Okay, so again, this is the whole sort of flow of things. A uh, whole sort of flow of things. From the C language, go to assembly, to MIPS. Okay, so you can see that we're repeating this thing a few times, huh? because you must understand why this module fit in. Correct? Uh, if not, every day you'll curse and swear, why did I take this module? Correct? So you must understand the bigger scheme of things. Why, why, why this module fits in in the midst of all the other things that you're studying? Correct? Uh, even though you may not deal with this anytime in the future, okay? Uh, at least it's good to know that when I write a program, what impact does the hardware have? What impact does the processor have on the software that I'm going to write? Okay? So, to simplify the notion of a computer, it is nothing more, correct, than to augment our power of storage and calculation. Okay? So, just like how we want to get, get from place A to place B, we have a car, don't have a car, we can still go there. Okay, same thing. Well, all the wonderful things that computers do, we can do without computers. Only thing, it will take a lot more time and a lot more effort. Correct? So, that's the reason why we have computers. 
Okay, so from computer organizing perspective, we are going to learn how things work, how we put things together. Okay, so uh, what exactly is a computer? Uh, so of course, computer in the past were always desktop system. Uh, in the past, then move on to laptop. Then now, even a handphone is considered a desktop uh, computer already. Correct? Okay. So there is no clear distinction on what is a computer because as long as it is a processor-based device. Okay, with the ability to uh, execute your code and provide you with some output, with uh, some interface, then we consider a computing device. Okay, so of course the main thing, like I said, that we will look for when we are buying a system is what CPU. Why CPU? In our mind relates to what? In our mind, when we say CPU processing power means we have more uh, bandwidth, more ability to do more things. Correct. So when we look at CPU, that's why the advertiser always focus on CPU. What is the clock rate at which I can run? How many bit processor I have? Correct. Why? Because the mindset is if I have a more uh, capable processor, my system will be more powerful. Okay. So again, this is the motherboard that I was telling you about earlier. So from, of course, a desktop you open up is a very big motherboard. I don't know how many of you still got desktop, but okay. Um, anybody still got desktop? Uh, not many, correct? Most of you either got laptop or tablet only you now. Okay, but whatever it is, you will see something similar inside. If you open up a, a board with all the chips inside. Okay, this, what you see here, this picture is actually just the chip. The chip is where? This one here. The one in the center. Okay? Uh, so that CPU that sits is the main processing power of your entire system. Okay, so that processing power, if you look at it, is has a lot of subsections: your control section, your cache, okay, your pipelining, okay, your memory interface, I/O interface. So all these are some of these things are what we're going to be covering in this module. All right, if I look inside a processor, what is actually happening? Okay, so these are some of the things we're going to be covering. Okay, so this is a simplified view. Huh? so effectively. Any computing system must have input and output. Correct? If you don't have input or output, what is it? It's just a rock. Correct? Uh, if you don't provide anything and you don't get anything back, then why do you want it? Correct? Uh, so any computing system must have some input, must have some output. That's the reason why you have it in the first place. Okay? So of course, the way in which you provide the input and the way in which you get the output may differ. Okay? Uh, depending on the device. And ultimately what? When I provide some input, there must be some brains inside the system to do some computation and tell me what to do next. Correct? So that is the part of the CPU. Okay? So the CPU or central processing unit's job is to take in the input data, do some processing, and give me some output. Okay? Of course, uh, it has subsections like control unit ALU. And most importantly, what? Almost all systems need to have some memory. Okay, very rarely do you have a computing system that does not need to have memory. You still need memory at least to store the code. All right, uh, that is going to run on it. So definitely you need memory in any form of computing system. Okay, so of course the next generation of computing devices are already now present. Right? All this is not futuristic, it's already present, correct? Right? Uh, those virtual keyboards, uh, a lot of different ways in which you can interact with computers and so on. So all these are already uh, current generation, in fact, not even next generation. Uh, of course, in movies, we see a lot more uh, fun, cool stuff. I'm not sure whether you all watch this movie. Have you all watched this? Minority Report. Uh, terrible movie. Okay. Okay, so in this movie, you can see uh, Tom Cruise using hands to control uh, visual user interface. Okay? Uh, of course, uh, we all know Elon Musk. Okay, so if you read about him, you will know that he is planning even the next sort of big revolution uh, through this neuro uh, computing uh, division that he has. Correct. Okay, so they are all having very wonderful ideas. Correct on where computing is going to bring us. Okay, and of course, with the advancement in technology, computers have also. Uh, uh, shrinking in size, okay, tremendously. If you just look at it, in 2014, 
Okay, in 2014, the computer was already in SD card. Okay, that's how the SD card. Okay, just recently, uh, about two months back, it is small enough to be on a tip of a rice grain. Okay, so that is the advancement in the technology on making computers uh, as small as they can be. Okay, so things are getting very exciting, all right? Okay, in terms of where we are headed. Okay, so it's definitely very exciting that we are in computing at this point of time. Okay, so again, computer organization, why we are studying it, I think you've done enough of that. Okay, so what we are going to be studying is again how hardware and software interact together. Okay, and what kind of impact software will have on hardware and vice versa, how hardware will impact software. So that is the gist of the whole module. Okay, so that sort of brings us to the end of the first chapter. Let's go for a break. Okay, uh, I'll meet you back. Now is 4.45. Okay, meet you back at 5. Okay, 5 o'clock. Don't, don't, don't run away, huh? next topic important. Huh?
Okay. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so thank you for staying. Okay, uh, so let's get started on the second lecture. So every week we got three hour lectures, correct? Two hours on Tuesday and one hour on Wednesday. Okay, uh, which is more for compared to other modules. Uh. So other modules usually we have only two hour lecture per week. Okay, this module has three hour lecture. Okay, because of the content we have to cover. Okay, so lecture two or overview of C programming. So this lecture and Tomorrow's lecture as well, all is going to be on C programming. Okay, so uh, so if done C, CS 1010 in C and you already know all this stuff, then I just uh, take it as a revision. Okay. Okay, so we are going to be looking at uh, C program. Okay, uh, what it is, how does it actually translate into some form of hardware? Okay, uh, what are the variable data types and so on? Okay, so some very basic stuff. Uh, in terms of C programming. Okay, so as uh, we, met, we saw earlier, the creator of C, okay, uh, Dennis Ritchie. Okay. And uh, over the years, C has uh, adopted or, or sort of had several variations. Okay, so along the way, since C was changing, uh, they decided to come up with a particular standard called NCC or the C90 standard. So when you say you're NCC, you have certain rules you have to follow in terms of programming uh, and so on. Okay, uh, Different industries have different standards. Okay, So if you, for example, work in the, if you happen to work in the automotive industry, okay, and you work on those uh, applications related with automotive vehicles, they have different standards, okay, called MISRA. Okay, so they have different kind of standards. Why? Because uh, if your program is dealing with uh, those situations where it's a life and death issue, correct? automotive is very critical. Correct? So they have different standards to follow in terms of how you write a program. Okay, so certain things are allowed, certain things are not allowed. So similarly, every standard has certain uh, rules to follow. Okay? Uh, of course, uh, we said that it was uh, at Bell Labs that where it was created. Uh, of course, over the years, uh, Bell Labs was also acquired by Nokia. Hopefully you all know Nokia. Okay, it's not my generation. Huh? Nokia is trying to make a comeback. Huh? Hopefully it makes a comeback. Okay, so Nokia acquired Bell Labs recently. Okay, so I just put that screenshot there because I felt it was quite uh, interesting caption they have. Uh, developing disruptive research for the next phase of human existence. Quite scary. Huh? That means the current one means we all die. You know, correct? Okay, so uh, that's what the uh, catchphrase is. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, look again, a uh, quick review of your C programming. So in your Unix system, for example, when you use your Vim tool, you create a C code, okay? And that is your source code, okay? Your C file is basically your source code, okay? After that, you compile it using the GCC command, okay? Uh, of course, the slides here are sort of related to you using the SIGWIN that you're going to use in the lab or you're going to use your Unix. Uh, in terms of C programming, there are a lot of development tools out there. Uh, if you look at some of the YouTube videos I posted, I've used a different platform called DevC. Similarly, you can use a lot of different development environments to do C programming. Okay, a lot of them support C programming. You can also download your Microsoft uh, Visual Studio. They also support C programming. Okay, so there are a lot of different tools there. Okay, so this slide only is talking about one particular tool and one particular process. Okay, uh, so it's just uh, for you to, to have a heads up on that. Okay, so of course, when you compile, if you cannot compile, that means there is some error. Okay, there's some error, then you have to go back and edit your code, correct? Until you clear all the errors, then finally you get an executable code. Okay, and in your uh, Linux and so on, you get a .out file. So you just, the name of the .out file uh, is by default A. Okay, so when you do a compilation, the default output file that's generated is called a.out. Okay, so of course you can change it, which we will show you in a while. Okay, uh, well once you execute a .out file, you will see the, the whatever code that you return in your C program being executed. 
Okay. So again, if your result is incorrect, that means something is wrong with the output. Okay. Then you have to go back again and check your program. Okay. So the general form of a C program has first thing, which is the preprocessor directories. Okay. Then you have a main. This is the starting point. Okay. So your program starts here. Your main function. Okay. And then you have curly braces. Okay. So this curly braces here that you see will be the opening and closing of your main function, and then you have your main uh, body of your function. Okay? And inside this main function header, like I said, every computing system will have three things. Input, output, plus what you do in between. Correct? Okay? So these are three main things that every system should have. So you have some input, okay? and of course, in most cases, when you're dealing with a computing system like this, your input is usually what you ask the user to enter. Okay, and then you have some processing you do with the data you collect, and finally you print some result. Okay, so those are the three basic operations you will do in your program. Okay, so this shows you a sample C program. Okay, so let's look at the sample run first. What really happens when you run this code? So first step is again GCC. Okay, when you just do GCC with your C file, you will generate the A dot out file. Okay, and when you type A dot out, you will execute your program. So in this program, they say enter distance in miles, and then you enter a distance and it translate it translates that value into kilometers. Okay, so let's have a look at this program to understand some of the important syntax in C. Okay, so if not coded in C before, these are all the common mistakes that you will probably make when you do it first time. Okay, uh, but of course, again, the good part is when you compile. And there's compile errors. The compile errors will give you some indication. Correct? Uh, it's always one of the errors, so they'll help you to fix it up quickly. So the first thing is uh, semicolon uh, terminates a statement. So almost a majority of the statements that you have will end with a semicolon. Okay, so you can see, for example, when I do a printf, there's a semicolon. When I do a scanf, there's a semicolon. When I do some computation, there's a semicolon, and so on. Okay, so many statements in C will end with a semicolon. So that's the first thing. Okay. Before the main, so the main is the starting point, but before the main, you have this thing called preprocessor directives. Okay. So these preprocessor directives, okay, what are they? Okay, we will come to that in a while. But these are things that you put before the main. Okay. Uh, so the first thing here is a hex include. stdio.h. What is stdio.h? Somebody said, don't say studio without the U or what? Huh? It is standard I.O. Okay, standard I.O. dot H. What is standard I.O.? So your standard I.O. is your definition of the input output for your device. Alright, okay? So in a computing system, by default, the standard input will be your keyboard. Correct, and the standard output will be your monitor. Okay, so all this is already defined. So that is why when I say print F, it knows that I need to print to the screen. It never go print on your printer, correct? Okay, it never send this string to your printer to print out because it knows that that is not the standard I/O device. Correct, the standard output device is your print monitor. Okay, so all this is defined in the header file. So when I include the header file, I know that when the print F is executed. The standard output where this string should be sent to is my monitor screen. Okay, uh, scanf is to capture the user input. Okay, so when I execute a scanf, I know I'm supposed to capture a user input. Again, from where? It's supposed to be from the keyboard input. Correct? Okay, so it's waiting for the user to provide some input through the keyboard. So that's the scanf. So this input and output is defined in the stdio.h, uh, standard io.h. Okay? Uh, then, of course, you have your main program. So this main program is the starting point. For any C uh, code that you write, the main is the starting point. And there can only be one main. Okay, When you have multiple functions, uh, you can have other names, but there can only be one main, because that is the starting point of the C program. Okay, So uh, that is the starting point. So when you start, okay, uh, what, what am I doing here? Okay. 
So here, before I execute the program, I need to declare some variables. Correct? So that is the first step that we're doing here. We are declaring some variables. Okay? Float here is the data type. Okay? So when I say float miles, kilometers, that means I'm declaring two variables. Okay, when you say declaring two variables, means what? That means in your memory system. Okay, in your memory system, I will set aside two memory location. Correct? I'll set aside two memory location. Now, will the two memory location be side by side? I declare them as float, miles, and kilometers together, correct? Okay, two variables, miles and kilometers. Two variables, two data types. That means I need two memory slots, correct? Uh, to hold this data. Now, if I look at the memory view, like assuming that this is my memory view, will miles and kilometers be allocated side by side? Yes or no? How many say yes? How many say no? How many want this to be asked in the midterm? Trick question, trick question. Will I ask? Don't know yet. I'll think about it. Okay, so the question is, we do not know. Okay, we do not know. We cannot say. It may be, it may not be, correct? Uh, it may not be, you know, because all this is depending at the point of time when you compile the code. Okay, at the point of time when you compile the code, the compiler will decide, okay, where is my free memory, and from the free memory, which slot shall I give for miles, which slot shall I give for kilometer? Okay, it might be side by side, it might be in two random locations. Okay, we cannot say. Okay, but ultimately we know that we have allocated two memory slots to hold data for us. Okay, then of course we have a printf and scanf. Okay, printf is to capture input data from the user. Okay, sorry, printf is to print out a screen to tell the user something. Alright, scanf is to capture input data. Okay, so scanf, again, we'll come to that in a while. So after I capture the data, I'm storing it inside this variable called miles. Okay, so inside this variable called miles, I'm storing the data. Okay, so let's assume the user key in 10. Okay, then what do I do next? I do some calculation here. 10 multiplied by k kilometers per mile. And this kilometers per mile, where is this? This is defined here, correct? Okay? This is a defined as 1.609. So you can see that this is under a preprocessor directive called hex defined. Okay? This hex defined, when you put as a variable, these are what you call constants. Okay? So when you have constants in your code, you can declare them, or you should declare them, as a preprocessor. Okay? Uh, why do you want to do it this way? Okay, why don't I just take away this and put as 1.609 in my code? It's only one number, what? why must I put one additional line and put 1.609? Okay? The reason why is because uh, in most cases when you declare constant, in your code, in, it makes it easy for you to manage the value you assign to your constant. Okay? Uh, for example, okay, if I need to do this calculation a few times in my code, okay? and if I put the explicit value in my line as 1.609, then if I want to change, okay, let's say later on I decide that I don't want 1.609, I want to put 1.6093, I want one more decimal place. Okay? Then I will end up having to go and change in all the places, correct? Okay, but if I declare it as a constant, then I just come back here and add the tree here. That automatically is update, updated everywhere it is mentioned, correct? Okay, so that is the reason why you have a constant. Okay, and once I get the answer, subsequently I do a printf to print out the answer. Okay, so this is a general flow and syntax of the C program. Okay, uh, we will look at more of it uh, along the way. Okay, so a standard header file, constant. Okay, so there are reserved keywords here. So for example, int, void, float are all reserved keywords. Okay, uh, the good part is usually most editors reserved keywords will show up in different colors. Okay, so you automatically know that this is reserved. Okay, so you cannot use this same 
name for your variable or for other functions and so on. Okay. Uh, comments. Of course, in your code, you must always have comments. So to put a comment, you can put a double slash. Double slash is until the end of the line. If you want to have a multi-line comment, you can put slash star followed by star slash. Okay, that is a multi-line comment. Okay. Okay. So in terms of computer memory, okay, one of the important things again, a uh, common mistake is what is the initial value before we do anything. Okay. So do not assume that they contain zero. No, sometimes, yes, you print out, hey, every time I declare and I just print out, it always says zero. Okay, yes, maybe it's the case. But you cannot assume it's going to be zero. Okay? So the initial value is always a question mark. Okay, we cannot say what is the initial value. Okay? When your code executes and you ask the user for the input and we execute the scanf statement, whatever the user enters goes into the memory location that is reserved for miles. Okay. Subsequently, I execute the calculation and update the memory location called k kilometers. Correct. So that is what is happening in terms of memory. Okay. At the architecture level, okay, there are two main architectures for computer design. Okay. Uh, one of it is called von Neumann. Okay. Uh, named after the person who created it. Okay. And of course, the other one is called Harvard architecture. Okay, uh, we are going to be looking at the von Neumann architecture uh, instead of the Harvard architecture because it's uh, a lot easier. Okay, why is it a lot easier? Because in von Neumann architecture, the whole idea is you have a single memory unit to store program and data. Program and data are two separate things. Okay, program is the code that you write. Okay, the logic, the sequence. Data is all the variables that you have, all the memory location you need access to. Okay? In your in Harvard architecture, the design is to keep both this memory as separate. Okay? In von Neumann architecture, both of them are considered as a single continuous block of memory. Okay? So that is why you can see there's only one memory unit here. Okay? So the von Neumann architecture is what we're going to be using. Okay? As we saw earlier, your first step is always your input device. In this case, it's your keyboard. Correct? And whatever I enter will go into my CPU okay, to do the execution. So in our case, the execution is to do the multiplication. And after I do the multiplication, I get the result. Okay? So of course, after I get the result, I store in memory. Correct? Okay? I store in memory. And subsequently, I also do a printout, okay, to the screen to tell the user the answer. Okay, so that is the whole idea of the architecture. So the two variables that we saw are miles and kilometer, okay, and these are what we call the variables. When you declare a variable, you must have a type and a name. Okay, a variable must have a data type. Okay, and must have a name. Integer is one of the data type, float, character, double, and so on. So we're going to look at that. Okay? You can also initialize during declaration. If I just declare int count, that means inside my memory, okay, I'm going to set aside one memory location reserved for count. Okay? But if I initialize, then I say that the starting value is 3. Okay, if I don't initialize, then of course I cannot say what is inside. It's not zero, it can be anything. Okay? It's an unknown value. Okay, so what happens if I try to do something like this? Okay, I've created a variable called count. Okay? So there is a memory location called count. And I say count plus 12, the answer put back inside count. Okay, count plus star answer put in star. So what will happen? We do not know what is going to be the final outcome because we do not know what is the initial value of count, correct? Okay? But when I compile this, will there be an issue? If I try to compile this code, will there be an issue? Yes or no? Yes or no? 
Okay? It will only show a warning. Okay, it will only show a warning. It will not show as an error because there is no error. Human fault is not computer fault. Okay? So this is not considered an error, it's just a warning. That means it's trying to tell you that count is used, okay, uninitialized. Okay? So this is the good part of the compiler. So some of the warnings, some of the errors, they will give you some hints at some of the mistakes that you might make. Okay? So again, this is a common mistake. All of us will make this mistake. Huh? We may think that we have initialized it, but we forgot to initialize it. Then we go and use it. Okay? So how do I get warnings? I, if I want to get warnings, I must compile with the dash wall, W-A-L-L. W-A-L-L -L is to turn on the warnings. If I don't put the dash wall, then I will not get the warnings. I will only get error. I compile error. So it's important that when you use the DCC command, you use the correct command if you want to get the full list of actions, you want to get warnings and so on. Okay? And in some case, we may also have redundant initialization. Okay, you initialize, but immediately after initialize, you go and put in a new value. So it makes no point anyway. Correct? Okay? Or in this case, you initialize, but then you override it with a scanf. Again, makes no uh, sense to initialize. Okay, so it's redundant. Okay, so C is a uh, language where you must have a data type that is assigned to it. Okay, it must be declared with the data type. Some programming languages don't need data type. You just say variable var, and then you can put in a number, you can put in character, you can put in decimal value, you can put anything. Okay, whereas in C they are very specific. Okay, uh, but then again, even though they are specific, they also give you flexibility to switch around. Okay, that means an uh, integer can suddenly become a character, a float can become a double, and so on. So you can still sort of do casting. Okay, to change from one data type to another data type. Okay, along the way. Okay, basic data types in C that you will use very frequently in your program, int. Int are for integers. Okay. Integers are whole numbers. Okay, the range of whole number depending on the number of bytes that you have. Huh? So different systems, different compilers, and so on may use different number of bytes for different data types. Okay, uh, so integer is generally in most compiler is four bytes. Float or double, uh, for float is four bytes, and double is eight bytes. Okay, float and double is to store decimal point values. Character is always a single byte and is used to store character values, uh, usually in single code. Okay, so in C, like I said, even though it's considered as a strongly type, why strongly type? Because if I say int count, this count should only be used for integer value. If I say char grade, character grade, then this grade can only be used for integer value. Okay, compared to maybe JavaScript where I just use var and I can use this variable to store anything. Okay, by having said that, like what I mentioned, you also have the ability to do type conversion. Okay, so even though they are strict about having a data type, they also give you flexibility to do type conversion, okay, which we will see. Okay, how do I know the size of the data in my system? So when you're dealing with the system for the first time and you want to know, if I declare integer, how many bytes am I going to get? If I declare float, how many bytes am I going to get? So inside my C library, there is a built-in size of function. So when you use the size of function, you can automatically know how many bytes I can allocate, or the system will allocate to me when I declare integer or float or double or whatever. Okay, so for number integer is four bytes. Okay, uh, in this particular system that we have, a float is four bytes, double is eight bytes. Okay, why is this number important? Okay, why is this number important? It is yes the the space that you have, correct? That means it gives you an indication of the largest and the smallest number you can hold. Okay, so if I go back one slide here. Okay, if I have four bytes, the, the smallest number is negative two to the power of 31, and the largest number is two to the power of 31 minus one. 
Okay? You may think, wow, this number is so big, sure, I won't hit one. Not necessary, correct? Especially if you are doing audio processing, image processing, so many pixels of data you're dealing with. Okay? Very easily you hit this number. Okay? And then you realize, hey, how come my image only process halfway, then something go on? Because along the way you forgot that you run the loop so much that you overflow. Correct? You go past the largest number and go back to the negative number. Okay? Then everything go haywire. Okay? So it's important to know the limits that you have. Okay? So you know uh, which data type to use. Okay, so just now we said that by default, the output file is A dot out. How do I specify my own name for the output file? I put a dash O. Okay, so when I put a dash O and I put the file name, then it will generate the output file based on this new file name. Okay, so if I don't put a dash O, then by default it's A dot out. Okay, if I put a dash O in the command line, then it will generate, for example, in this case, data types dot out. Okay, as the output file. Okay, so the preprocessor directives that we talked about just now. Okay, so we have X hash include stdio or H that we saw earlier. Okay, now what else do we have? Okay, so of course we have a maths function. So if you want to declare or uh, you want to use some maths functions, uh, trigo functions, square root functions, and so on, then you need to include a math.h file. Okay. The input is the scanf. Okay, we will look at that now. Okay, do the computation and finally do the printf. Okay, so this is the basic structure again and again. Okay, that we were looking at. The header file again uh, is to include specific library functions that your system is going to tap on. Okay, when you include the header file, it doesn't mean that everything in the header file will get compiled in. No, only those functions that you specifically use in the header file, those will be extracted and used in when you compile your code. Okay, so that is for your header file. Uh, for GCC command, if I want to use maths header file, I need to compile with the dash lm option. Okay, so you need to remember. So if I want to use a maths function and I want to uh, incorporate the math.h file, when I compile the GCC command, I must put the dash lm. Okay, so the def hex defined macro that we saw. Okay, so the main reason why you want to use the hex defined macro is to specify constant. Why? Because this will be repeated in different parts of your code. So if I only do it once, then subsequently I don't need to change it in many, many places. I just go back to the main place and change it. It is reflected everywhere else. Okay, using all capital for macro is a recommendation. It's a guideline, not compulsory, okay? Why they say use all cap is so that when you look at your code, it's very obvious which one is a variable, which one is a macro, okay? So it's easy for you when you do your debugging that you can differentiate easily between a, a variable data type and a macro data type, okay? So ultimately, the compiler will not see this name, pi. You will only see the value. Why? Because this is a preprocessor. Preprocessor will run one step before the compile process. Okay, then before, when I click on compile, the preprocessor will run first. So what will the preprocessor do? It will go in and see, okay, I have a hex defined pi 3.142. So it will look at your whole code. Wherever I see pi, I replace with 3.142. Okay, so that's the preprocessor. Then only the compilation will run. Okay, so the preprocessor, uh, the compiler does not see the variables associated with constants. Okay, input output statements. Okay, uh, so printf, as we saw, that's the basic output statement. Scanf. Okay, scanf is to capture the data type, uh, data from the user. And when you do scanf, you need to specify a format here. Okay, percentage %d, percentage %lf, percentage %f, and so on. Okay, when you look at scanf here, okay, you can see that I say scanf. Okay, for example here, percentage %d. I use percentage %d for integer data type. Okay, percentage %f for float, percentage %lf for double. Okay, percentage %c for character. And what do you notice here? I need to put a ampersand sign 
and the variable name here. Okay, whenever I use scanf, okay, I must put a ampersand sign before the variable name. Okay, this ampersand sign is very important. Right? Again, a common mistake. Okay, uh, most students will make. This ampersand sign refers to what? It refers to the address. of the variable, OK? That means what? When I declare this variable integer h, OK? When I have declared this variable integer h, that means somewhere in my memory location, OK? Somewhere I have set aside space, and I say this is for the h variable, OK? And now when I capture this scanf, this scanf statement is capturing input from the user through the keyboard, correct? Okay, so when this user key in this input, what do I want to do? I want to take that input that the user key in and transfer it into this memory location. Correct? I want to transfer it into this memory location. So in order for me to take this data and put it into this particular memory location, I must know the address of the memory location. Okay, the address is specified by putting the ampersand sign in front of the variable name. Okay? So there's two things associated with variable. One is the data that the variable holds. The second is the address of this variable. The address of the variable is where is it stored in this whole memory system. Okay, the data is the actual value that is inside this variable. Okay, so there's two different things. Okay, and this is important huh? when you talk about pointers uh, next week. Okay, when you talk about pointers, you will revisit this topic again. Okay, the concept of data and address. Okay, so that is why when you use scanf, you must put the m percent sign. Okay, so m percent h refers to the address uh, of the memory cell. Okay, so which placeholder or format specifier I must use depending on data type. Okay, so most of us will we only use percentage d, percentage c, and percentage f for float or double. Okay, so these are three most common format specifier you will use. Okay, uh, of course you can do formatting in your display. Okay, so if I'm a bit particular and I want to, okay, if I want to display uh, up to five locate five digits, then I specify percentage five D. Okay, it can be right justified, it can be left justified. Okay, same thing when I'm doing a percentage F, that means decimal point. If I only want three decimal point, then I put percentage dot three F. So I will print out the decimal value up to three decimal places. Okay. Uh, then there are also some common escape sequences. Okay. Uh, slash n is to go to a new line. Okay. So you can see, for example, here, uh, here but they put a slash n here. Okay. Why did they put a slash n? That means after I print this line, my cursor will go to the next line. Okay. Uh, so sometimes you can also put the slash n in front. So you will go to a new line first, and then print this current statement. Okay. Uh, if I want to have tab spaces, I can put slash t and so on. Okay, so all these are things you can try. Uh, so all those sample codes, so we, inside the lecture notes folder, all the sample code is also given. Okay. So you can actually go in and compile and, and see for yourself okay, how it works. Okay, so the computation, again, the bulk of it is inside the main body. Okay, that's what you have seen. Okay, so we declare variables. Okay, uh, generally variable names uh, are case, um, declared in lowercase. You must, Im very important, another common mistake, it is uh, case sensitive. Okay, uh, so when you declare variables, stick with a common uh, format that you want to follow, okay? So either all lowercase or camel case or underscore or whatever, okay? So stick with a particular style that suits you and be consistent, okay? So you know that uh, the way you are declaring variables and naming variables. Okay, again, reserve keywords, generally they show up as different colors, so it's easy for you, okay? As well as those common functions. 
Okay, assignment statements. When we do a calculation like this, we are doing a computation and we are assigning it. So the assignment operator is a single equal sign. Okay? And the left side of the equal sign is called the L value. Why is this important? Because, again, you will hear, you will see a common mistake where the L value cannot be assigned. That means what? That means the way you have written your expression is a bit funny. Something is wrong. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Okay? So, for example, when I do this statement here, sum equals to sum plus item. That means I'm taking the value of sum, add into item, and put back into sum. Okay? Some of us may interpret and do it the other way around. For example, if I put 32 equals to A, A plus B equals to C. Okay? Mathematically, it looks correct. Okay? But in terms of C, it's wrong. Okay, why? Because I'm trying to do a assignment of right to left here. Correct? And A is a data type. 32 is not a variable. I cannot assign a variable to a number. I can assign a number to a variable. Okay? So the order is important. Same thing over here. A plus B equals to C. Okay? What you will get? You will get an error to say that the L value is not, uh, cannot be assigned. Why? Because in this case, the L value is A plus B. Okay? And A plus B is an expression. Okay? It's not a data type. It's not a variable. Okay? So you need to be careful of how you write your statements to see which one is allowed, which one is not allowed. Okay? Uh, you can also have uh, statements like this where multiple variables are assigned together. Okay? And you can also do funny things like this. Okay? Most students, once they are a bit proficient, they will try to do a lot of fancy code. Okay? They will try to make it so cryptic that nobody can understand except themselves. Okay? So if you do something like this, you are doing two things at the same time. You are assigning 10 to B, and at the same time, you're saying 5 plus 10. Okay? So two things will happen concurrently. Okay? Uh, so again, though it's nice to do this kind of funny things, uh, please be careful because after all, you myself will forget what you did. Okay? Then you'll confuse yourself even more. Okay? So a few other important things. Uh, binary operators, unary operators. Okay? What are binary operators? Okay? Uh, these are single operators here, plus, minus, times, divide, and percentage. Okay? Uh, and the order, as you can see, different operators will operate from left to right. Some will operate from right to left. Okay? So, for example, here, 46 divided by 15 divided by 2, what will happen? It will be 46 divided by 15, which is 3, then 3 divided by 2 will be 1. Okay? Uh, same thing over here. Okay? It will be left to right. Okay? This is right associative. So this is actually equals to what? X equals to X minus 23. Okay? This is equals to P equals to P plus 4 times 10. Okay? So it will be uh, execution from left to right. Okay? And what happens is sometimes when you write this kind of code, you are confusing yourself on which one is going to happen first. Correct? Okay? So the best way is to always respect the parenthesis rule. Okay? As much as possible, use your brackets to enforce the order. Okay? If you don't use brackets, okay, what will happen is sometimes you think that you are executing opera, uh, operation 1 followed by operation 2, but in the end, because of the order of precedence, it becomes the other way around. Okay? So if you're not sure, always use brackets to enforce the order. Okay? Okay, another important thing is when you use integers, you are supposed to store whole number. Okay, but if I try to store a decimal, okay, if I try to store a decimal, what will happen? The answer will be truncated. Okay, the answer will be truncated. So it will not show as error. It will, okay? it will not show as error, but the answer will become truncated. Okay, so I think we will stop here for today. Okay, uh, so as you go back, uh, go through the lab one material. Uh, even though lab one is only in week three, 
go through lab one just to install the uh, SIGWIN compiler okay, in your system and then you can go ahead to try some of the C code that you have. Okay, so all the C samples we have, you can actually try. So lab one will give you the instructions to do the installation. Okay, so uh, again, important ah, uh, Okay, important, please make sure you settle your tutorial and lab slot ah. Uh. Okay, uh, if you are an exchange student, okay, you don't have access to course, please go to the UG office. Okay, COM1 level 2 and ask them for help. They will help you to do the registration. Okay, so I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. I applied for it and got rejected the first time, but they left me two records. When I got here, I showed them that I had it, and they were like, okay, but you know, I missed out on the first election. Now I just have to go get someone from Scotland. Yeah, so it's only about one to assign access to the negative. I put, oh, yes.